Everybody that loves the Lord, say amen. amen. Take your Bibles and go to Revelation chapter 3. <clears throat> Hadn't the Lord been good to us? Amen. Be seated for just a moment. I want to share a prayer request with you before I read the scriptures. <clears throat> year and a half ago, the Lord put me in an extended fast time of prayer, a special Bible fast, and <clears throat> several things happened, Pastor, when I came out of that season of prayer, and I, <clears throat> I believe I, sh I was here, maybe one of the very first services, right after that season of prayer in my life and anyway in a year and a half I've not had the gout to cripple me since that time and uh, I was going down about three times a year maybe four uh, to where I was crippled and couldn't get up out of a chair or out of a bed for about three days <clears throat> now it may come back tomorrow but the Lord has healed that and um, and I don't know what all happened there, but I've not been crippled with the gout since. That's not what I was going to tell you. I'm just kind of happy about that. <clears throat> but one of the things that has uh, happened is the Lord opened up immediately several overseas. Now, he gave us our Albania missionary. You've heard me talk about that before. And coming out of that season of prayer, God gave us our missionary we'd been praying for. <clears throat> and they're there right now. Got about 12 people in Albania as we speak. And I'm a dying to be there, but the Lord told me to, that I had to sit this one out. Because if I was there, I'd surely take over. <laughs> and that poor fella, he needs Brother Aaron. He needed to take the group. And I needed to be out of his way so he could feel God. Kind of like what some of you mamas need to do for some of your youngins. <laughs> that was mean. That jumped right out, Pastor. <clears throat> Quit babying them and let them grow up. Say amen right there. Amen. They need to sit in jail a night or two. You always bailing them out. And you spoiling them. And they can't get a hold of reality or eternity because you keep fixing everything for them. <clears throat> Say amen. amen. And so, and uh, you know you're an evangelist when you can get mean in the middle of a prayer request. <laughs> but, but they're there now. And one of the special things that's happened is that immediately, Brother Lawson, all within a measure of maybe 10 days, I had about five or six invitations to come overseas and preach. Unsolicited, uh, just out of nowhere, uh, invited to Thailand. An, an old man, I say an old man, me and him, he was one of my daddy's deacons when I was a boy. And now he's in Thailand with an orphanage and a church. And he asked me to come preach. And then a man uh, in Uganda, Africa, Tommy Harrison, uh, him and his church, they've got a compound over there with a medical clinic and a school and a church, and they have two Bible institutes for preacher boys, young men called in the ministry on either side of Lake Victoria. And, they, and I'm going over there shortly to preach and be a part of that ministry. And almost on every continent, I could keep telling you, but I don't want to bore you, and uh, one of my uncles, who was a great pastor and a great preacher, has, uh, <clears throat> there was a death of a great mission board leader, long story short. He's been handed almost the great ministry down in Honduras. And there's over 600 churches that have been started down there. 600 in them jungles. And every time a young man gets saved, they train him, get on fire for God, and they'd put him in their Bible college and then they'd take him back to his village and help him start a church. And so 
uh, he said, you need to brush up on your Spanish. And <laughs> I said, the only thing I know how to do is order from Taco Bell. <laughs> and I can do that in pig Latin. Come on now. Backwards if you want me to. 39, 59, 79. Them days are gone, ain't they? That's, but. And then, the, and almost, almost every continent that, and God showed me a, a verse, the Lord did, John 6, 25, and when they had found him on the other side of the sea, and the Lord put that in my heart, and when they had found him on the other side of the sea, and the Lord told me that's where I'll be, and you come find me. <laughs> Ain't that good? God gave me a staff coming out of that fast. Uh, this church, the brother who runs that camera normally, gave us his trailer, and Brother Eric and his daddy, they have this wonder marvel truck with everything in the world. They could build an airplane out of the things that man has on the back of his truck. <clears throat> I think he pulled an airplane out once by accident. No, we don't need that, and just put it back. But they helped me with that trailer. And uh, God has done some great things. I bless his name for it. I want y'all to pray for me. It's the only reason I talk about those things. Is God's enlarging, God's enlarging the horizons, but he needs to enlarge in our heart. And, and he's got to enlarge that hedge. And what these kids sang a while ago, these young people, a wall of prayer. That's what we got to have, is that wall of prayer. Brother Lawson, I'm going to Uganda. Uh, I needed $5,000. I've raised $3,600 in the, in the last, well, in three recent meetings. Two or three churches, I said I didn't feel like I could ask them for anything. <laughs> and so I didn't. But, <clears throat> but we've raised $3,600. And need 1,400 more shortly for that. You help me pray about that. But I want you to pray a hedge about us. <clears throat> I need somebody, I need somebody to get a burden to pray in these hours. Now, I believe God's always used a remnant. That's all he's ever had is a remnant. God's never had the majority. I'm about to run. He never needed the majority. God was always the majority. <laughs> he just, we need somebody to pray. Brother Lawson, when I was 16, I preached my first revival. God called me when I was 13. And, and I never will forget, I was 15 turning 16. And they called me to Asheville, North Carolina. And I never will forget, he was an older preacher. He had been a missionary, and he had a, a sweet family. And uh, he, he had an older daughter, much older than me, and she was still at the house. And I, think she's, I think she's wanting to pray about marrying me. <laughs> I prayed pretty hard the other way. But <clears throat> they put me in the basement. And I never will forget the funny things you remember. And there's a concrete floor, and I had a cot, and uh, it was a little foretaste of my life <laughs> that was coming. <laughs> but <clears throat> an evangelist. And I had pink stationery and a green ink pen. I have no idea why, but I remember that. And I wrote all my sermons with a green ink pen and a pink stationery. And I had to write all my sermons because I had four sermons. And I thought the meeting started on Monday night. And go Monday through Friday. And I figured by Friday, God give me that fifth sermon. But I had to get a ride. I didn't have a driver's license. And somebody drove me. And the only day they could take me was Saturday. And when I got there Saturday, the preacher said, we're having a get-together at a man's barn. I want you to go ahead and preach. And there went Monday night sermon. <laughs> and they said, you preach in the morning. We'll be live on the radio. And there went Tuesday night, Tuesday sermon. And then I preached Sunday night. And there went Wednesday sermon. And then he said, we're going to carry you to a preacher's fellowship. And they preached me in the fellowship. And there went my last sermon. And then the revival started that night. 
And so I made up stuff I didn't even believe and just told all of them. <laughs> and wrote it all on the, on the pink stationery with a green ink pen. But uh, I don't remember why. Oh, yeah, now, <laughs> I don't remember why I told that story. I got, but I was 16. Years later, I'm talking, I was in my early 30s. I ran into some of those people. And they said there's a little old widow woman and she just died. And they said, you don't know it, Brother Dean, but she took your picture in that revival. And she didn't have anybody. She's a little old lonely widow woman. And said she blew it up and put it on her piano and, pray, and prayed for you all these years. She said you was her little preacher. And she just had a bird and, and set it on that piano and prayed for you all these years. I'm about to run. I'm about to show these boys how you take a lap in church. <clears throat> Glory to God. Jesus had somebody praying for me. And I didn't even know it. <laughs> and between 16, and I'm going to tell you, Youngers between age seven, well, anymore, 16, 17, and 21, 22, you're going to make decisions that may affect irreversible decisions the entire rest of your life. Right. You better stay with God, youngins. Amen. 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 I just felt led to talk about that for a minute. Not sure why. But we need somebody to pray. Now, <coughs> in uh, Revelation 3, now you can stand. Our Lord, thank you for Calvary. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. I pray that you'd help us. I pray you'd breathe on us. I pray you'd breathe over us. And God touch this text tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Revelation 3 verse 7 and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Now I'm going to verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And he said down there in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. You may be seated. Brother Lawson, I have one burden on my heart that I want to share with the church. I was preaching recently in one of the <clears throat> worst churches that I preach for, they have gotten better. Something has happened a little bit better. And I simply was walking through the seven churches in these chapters two and chapter three. And I think the Lord rewarded me for being there trying to help that outfit. And I got right down to the end and the Lord showed me something that's blowed me off my feet. And I've been... I've been living on it and marveling in it for two or three weeks now. This, this is amazing. In one church, the church in Philadelphia, he said, I open and no man can shut. Amen. All right, you're going to have to get that Lutheran blood stirred up. Let's try again. He said, I open and no man shut. And I shut and no man can open. <clears throat> and he said, behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. 
And in the very next church, it's the opposite. Jesus is outside the door and won't open it or can't and will not. Leave it up to a man. That amazed me. Just to marvel. At, uh, there's two different pictures of the Lord here. I had never seen that, Pastor. That stark contrast. That in one church he looked so sovereign and so mighty. I shut and no man opens. I open and no man shuts. And in the very next church, he appears so human. I don't want to use the word helpless, but he's standing there and knocking and they will not let him in. Is that not amazing? I never have seen that. That just amazed me. Now, which church are you and which Christian are you? And I mean, I don't, now you've already heard the message. You just heard it. <laughs> now you got to chew on it with me. Because I'm just a chewing on that. That in one church, God stands there and says, I can do this and nobody can do anything about it. Y'all ain't helping me right there. And then in the very next church, it's, he's standing outside. They've put him out. He can't get in. It's in the hands of man. Isn't that strange? Just how polar opposite it appears. Oh my. So I was sitting there chewing on that thing. And I'm going to tell you something. It's a sad thing to lay the sea in church. It's a sad thing when you put Jesus on the outside. One of the commonest Chinese. One of those great Christians. And you know all the stories that come out of communist China of Christians and believers under persecution. One of those stories came out a few years ago that one of the great, great Christians was let out of prison over there and able to come over here and make a trip. And when he got back, they all wanted to know, tell us about the American church. Tell us about the American church. And Brother Lawson, the only thing he could tell them, he said, I am just very amazed at, at what all they can do without God. And what they have done without God. And brother, that it, now here's the first thing I noticed. And there's no outline, there's just a burden here. First thing I began to notice, as I examined that, because that blew me away, God's just sitting there saying that I shut and no man opens, I open it. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. Now, I wrote this down in my, in my notes in my Bible, that in one church, God set before man an open door that nobody could close. And in the next church, man set before God a closed door that he would not open. I'm going to say that again, honey, because the American church is in bad shape. Even our bestings. <laughs> Joe Parsons said we're breathing in the very atmosphere of lukewarmness and the best amongst us has to fight off that lukewarmness which leads to worldliness, which leads to idolatry. That led to seeing church and that Philadelphia church. In one church, God set before man an open door that nobody could do anything about. But in the very next church, Man presents before God a closed door that he will not open. And the only thing I could figure out right there, of course, was that one church was weak and the other and thought they were strong. He said to the little church, you've heard about the little train that couldn't, but he kept saying, I can. Well, honey, that was the Philadelphia church. They'll, you notice they did not get in trouble what did it say in the middle of verse 8? For thou hast a little strength. That's what was wrong with them. There was two churches out of the seven that had no rebuke when the Lord came by to deal with them churches. Was it Smyrna and Philadelphia? And there was nothing wrong with them. He had no rebuke, no sin to deal with, no, no fault to find. 
And he said, I, just, I know you've got a little strength. You're operating in weakness. He said, here, I'm going to open the door for you. I'm going to hold it open. But he got over to that Laodicean church, and look what they said in verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am. Now just underline that right there, honey. You ain't got to go no further. They said, I am. Isn't that one of his titles? He's the great I am. And honey, and you go to stealing God's glory and go to living in your own strength. And that's the American church tonight. We're rich. We're increased with goods. We have need of nothing. And honey, the church that don't need anything from God ain't going to get anything from God. So now, son, it was that church that was weak. And I want to stop right here and say, is that Christian that's weak that's going to get a truckload of his power? It's that, it's that Christian who puts his thumbs in his suspenders and says, I am. Well, honey, he'll be on the outside looking at this thing. The church that was weak, that didn't have any strength, was the one that he held, but they kept his word. They kept his name. They were faithful to his name. That amazes me. Which church are we? Which kind of Christian are we? We won't even let God break us down. We won't let God break us. Genesis 32, 24, and Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking. That's what we're missing. God touched him in the strength, touched him in his thigh, broke him, wrestled him down until the breaking of the day. This morning we talked about the breaking of the bread. Honey, we in bad shape until we get broken. They have to break a horse, don't they? They have to break an old bull, don't they? They got to break him. They got to break their will. They got to break. I'm going to tell you something, youngins. You're going to get in a lot of trouble if you let that old Adamic spirit run your life. I can. I am. Honey, he'll be on the outside. There's a picture there that amazed me, preacher. I never have, and I'm going to say this as a qualifying statement, and you say Amen. The son never has rebelled against the father. The son never has resisted the father's will. He cried out in pain. He looked in that cup. Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass. But there never was rebellion. There never was resistance. I need y'all to help me right there because I'm going somewhere. I've seen a picture. Brother Law said, you help me with this. I never have seen this in the meditations. That God the Father, what verse in Revelation 3 did he say that I'm sick of the lay of the sea and church. I'm ready to spew her out of my mouth. Is it verse 18? Somebody help me right there. My Bible's up there and it takes too many calories to get back up there. Verse 16. God the Father said, I'm this, the, that, that bride, she makes me sick. The Father was disgusted at the Laodicean church, but the Son went at the door walking in. <laughs> now I need y'all to help me right here. <laughs> you see it, ain't you? You see it a little bit. Of and I told you there ain't never been, there ain't never been any evil tension between the Father and the Son. But I, I'm about to run is what I'm about to do. God the Father in heaven says, she makes me sick. I'm about ready to puke looking at her. And Jesus said, I know, Father, but I love her. She's mine. Y'all ain't helping me. Do you see it? God the Father's in heaven. I wonder if you've ever seen, and I'm reaching a little bit here. I don't have an illustration. You ever seen a father that did not like that, that girl his boy was going to marry, but the boy loved her? <laughs> and that's not quite a good illustration, but it gives you an idea. There's the father in heaven. said, I'm ready to throw up looking at her. And the son says, I know. 
but she's mine. <laughs> she may have put me out, Daddy, but I still love her. Y'all ain't helping me. She's put me out. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> I paid for her. I paid for her. I died for her. I'm just amazed that he still won't sin. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm amazed that he won't sin. Looking at us. Does this remind you of Jose and Gomer? She was wretched. I'm going to say this and y'all better pop a happy bubble or I'm throwing an organ at a church organ at you. Didn't see didn't use it today. I'm going to throw it at somebody. Oh, listen. Jose and Gomer, I'm going to say this and y'all better, you better say amen. Don't say it like a modern Methodist either. Say it like an old timey Methodist. Gomer, she wasn't worth having the first time around, much less the second time. Amen. Well, you didn't make me happy there, but it's my fault. I better expound it, I guess. The first time he found her, she was already a woman of whoredoms, the Bible said. She is already filthy. She is already, y'all ain't helping me. She is already defiled. You're supposed to be seeing a picture of the sinner, me and you. We wasn't worth having the first time. <laughs> He came to her, honey, and God said, go to her and love her and buy her and marry her. That's what the father told the son to come after us. And we were defiled and we were filthy and we were vile and we were wretched and we were not attractive. Girls, look at me just for a second. Sin will make you so unattractive. There is a beauty in holiness. What have they been saying? Modest is the hottest. There is a beauty in holiness. And that's even different than modesty because holiness comes from the Lord. Girls, you ain't got to be, you ain't got to be sleazy and slimy in these days. Even though there ain't three real ladies left in America and nobody knows how to act anymore. You ain't got to be like one of them little harlots from Hollywood yes, running around to get, you get full of the Holy Ghost, get full of Jesus. He'll put a loveliness on you. He'll put a beauty on you. He'll put a glow that comes from glory. He'll make you, he'll get, and listen, fellas, you ain't pretty. <laughs> hey, Amen. A man's character is what makes him attractive to others. And a woman's holiness is what makes her attractive. Oh, my, there's Gomer. There's Gomer! She wasn't worth having the first time. But she really wasn't worth having the second time. She run off on him and showed her true nature. Went and had relations with other men. Went back to acting like a harlot. Had other children, I think, by them other men. But when they were done with her, when sin was done with her, when society was done with her, when Satan was done with her, y'all ain't helping me none. She ended up on the auction block. She is naked. She is diseased. She was wretched. She was skeletal. She looked like one of these, one of these harlots out here on AIDS or crystal meth beat up my hand. and she wasn't worth having the first time around. Amen. Much less the second time. Amen. But the Lord said, go and get her again. Love her again. Go get her back. And honey, they stood her up on the auction block and everybody folded her arm and said, get this wretched hag out of here. But a voice spoke up that day and said, she's mine. Amen. I'll have her. And you to go read it. He brought everything he had to pay for. <laughs> Nobody else was even bidding against him. But he brought everything. I'm about to run for what I'm about to do. Brought everything he had. And nobody was even bidding for her. God gave us everything he had. 
his lovely son hanging on Calvary and nobody else even wanted us. He could have got us at a discount there, but he gave the best he had for the worst he had. That's grace. He gave the best he had for the worst he had. His life for mine. His righteousness, my sinfulness. His holiness, my wickedness. His obedience for my disobedience. His submission for my rebellion. He left his heaven to get me out of my hell. He gave the best he had for the worst that they had. Nobody's even bidding. (laughs) He brought everything he had. And he said, I want her back. I don't know, Pastor, I just got to thinking about that when I seen Jesus wouldn't leave the door. And his father, she makes me sick. I know, but I paid for her. I'm in covenant with her. You sent me to get her, and I know she's made you sick now, Father. But we've, we've paid for her, and she's mine. I'm glad he'll have you back. I'm glad he'll have you back. That prodigal said, son, said, father, I'm not even worthy to be one of the servants. But his father never heard him. He was hollering back at the house. That boy was laying in the middle of that dirt road and his father was hunkered over him, holding him. And the fa- that boy was blubbering a prayer that nobody heard but two or three little Mediterranean dirt mites. <laughs> That was in the dirt. Because the father was a slobbering and a kissing him on the neck and hollering back at the house, bring forth the robe, the best robe, the fatted calf. Amen. Wasn't no tofu or wheat bark tree drink. Amen. It was the fatted calf. Say amen right there. The fatted calf. Oh, my. That thing amazes me, preacher. That to one church he'll be strong and sovereign and he'll open a door that no man can shut. And then the very next church, Jesus said it's in the hands of man. That amazes me. In one verse he said no man can do anything about this. And in the very next church, he said this is all up to one man. If any man will open that. That just amazes me how he works. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Oh, my. You just look at how God works. There's different pages on the Bible where there's such a contrast. You know, we have a lot of fuss in in theological preacher world about, you know, how people get saved or don't get saved. I like it in Acts chapter 8. It was a soul winner story with a lot of man involved. The Ethiopian eunuch. Reading Isaiah 53. How can I understand this except some man guide me? And God brought him a man, Philip, attached to the chariot. And it was all a soul winning story. But in the very, you turn your page to Acts 9 and he saved Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. And it was a whole sovereign story. God said, <laughs> I'm coming to save you. Paul's like, I'm trying to kill you. <laughs> Jesus like, I'm fixing to save you. <laughs> Knocked him off his donkey. No soul winner needed. I wish they had a witness right there. Amen. Knocked him off his donkey. Talked to him out of the heavens. The only feller trying to kill the church. And God said, I'm fixing to put you in charge of the church. <laughs> You're fixing to be in charge of the church. The old boy was eat up with the law. A Pharisee of the Pharisees. And God said, ah, let's just give you some grace. You're fixing to be a grace preacher. You're making Christians bleed all, and cry all across this country. I'm fixing to make you bleed and cry all across this country for my name's sake. Y'all ain't helping me. Don't get caught up with how things are carried out. If you build your theology on Acts 8, on how sinners get saved, You got to have a Bible. You got to have a soul winner. You got to have somebody really interested. (laughs) But you do. You better not hang it all on that, on that one hook, because you turn the page 
and there's no boy that don't even want to get saved. And God makes him the apostle to the Gentiles. What about that? In Romans 9, there's another contract. Romans 9, he says he has mercy on whom he will and he hardens whom he will. And then you flip it to chapter 10, he says, whosoever shall call. <laughs> Don't they get hung up on it, pastor? Them balances, them balances. Oh, and I'm just trying to show you that to the church that said, I can't, he said, I will. And to the church that said, I am, he said, I can't. I'm almost done. But I want you to know that to the Christian who says, I can't, but I really want to. He'll open a door, whatever door's in front of you, and he'll hold it, and every devil in hell, and every pagan in Hollywood, ain't gonna, and, every, and every ruler of this world, they ain't gonna be able to, they ain't gonna be able to mess with that door. Oh my, but if you young and you put your thumbs and your suspenders out, I'm gonna run my life. He, he's just gonna be on the outside waiting, knocking until you're ready to figure out you need him. I love that little, what verse is it where he said, if any man will open the door. When I was out at Camp Zion, Myrtle, Mississippi, they, Dr. Percy Ray, he started pastoring that church in 1935, 1934. I got to go in there and lay on that pulpit, lay behind that old wooden pulpit and pray. Right after I came out of that 40, right after I came out of that time of prayer, I ended up right on that pulpit. They told me, said, he didn't start Camp Zion. Camp Zion was started in 1949. Probably the greatest, well, hands down, the greatest camp meeting America's ever had in modern times. Go back to 1800. Your daddy's got a lot of that recorded, I believe. 1948, Israel was rebirthed. In 1949, Percy Ray started that camp meeting. And they preacher all over America went there to get filled with the Holy Ghost. They said he resigned that church. He'd been there 15 years. They said he resigned that church. <clears throat> Got fed up, fight, fussing and fighting for 15 years. 1949, he resigned and walked out in the swinging doors, was in the foyer and heading out the door. And one little woman, is everybody listening? One little woman, and they got her name in a window now up on the front. It's a German name, I can't pronounce it. <coughs> One little woman. They said she ran out there while them swinging doors were still swinging and grabbed the preacher's arm. And she said, Brother Ray, would you stay for just, <laughs> would you stay for just one? <laughs> Grab it. Would you stay for just one? He said God stopped him dead in his tracks. And he turned around and walked back in and they wasn't happy about it. But he stayed for one. Over the next six weeks, they voted out half the church. Somebody say amen right there. <laughs> said he came out of his prayer altar and started handing them their church letters as they come in the door and said <laughs> he'd met them on the front porch there's your letter and then them men met in that field you can go get his biography a ray of light Dr. Percy Ray I stood in that field when them old timers was there they got down in that field and they laid an old Schofield King James Bible out and them fireballs came from heaven. Don't know if they was shooting stars or fire or a comet. There's four fireballs come and lit the field up and they read the verse and prayed half the night. And God started Camp Zion. 
They raised $160,000 there one night, J. Harold Smith did, and there's people from 48 states in that place. The power of God sweeping through there, and you can't hardly find a preacher in America that was not touched and impacted directly or indirectly from one praying man on the Mississippi yeah. holding the nation together. Because I personally believe that when the 48, the Israel's reborn, that drawing power has gone back to the Jews almost completely. And there's a drawing them Jews up on the other side of the world. And you can't hardly even get Christians to go to church. Much less sinners. That drawing power is fading away fast. God let one man have a prayer. God let one man have an altar on the Mississippi and held this nation together. <laughs> oh, you say, I don't know anything about it. You don't need to. You're still here, ain't you? Now, Brother Lawson, he, <clears throat> he's the scholar on these matters. But I know this much, World War I, it prepared the land for the people. <coughs> Sir Lawrence of Arabia beat Cornwallis in there by two hours and they drove them Turkish Muslims out of Jerusalem. I almost ran just then. <laughs> World War I prepared the land for the people. And World War II prepared the people for the land. Amen. Hitler tried to cook them and extinguish them and get rid of God's elect. And all it did was draw them all back together and they come out of World War II and made a nation out of them. I wish I had somebody. And World War III is gonna put the Messiah back with his people in the land. Oh, by the way, I'll be involved directly in the one major battle of World War III. I'll be on a white horse somewhere behind the Son of God. Wanting to get a lick in real bad, but folks, we ain't gonna get a chance. I'm going to try to throw something right before. <laughs> the heaven's going to roll back like a scroll. We're going to be on white horses behind the Son of God, with the Son of God. And before you get a chance to get a shot in on the unholy trinity, beast, false prophet, antichrist, as they're gathered around Jerusalem, he's going to open his mouth and with a sharp sword. <sighs> I'm picking up something. I'm throwing something right before he does when they pull them curtains back, I thought as they're pulling, they're gonna get it just for that sharp turn. I'm throwing something. I've been mad at the devil a long time. If I gotta throw one of y'all, I'm throwing something. <laughs> I was trying to think what you could throw. I don't know. I'm grabbing you if you name me. We're going, we're going there anyway. You'll get there right ahead of it. You'll be fine. Your horse will catch you. You'll probably be a glorified, glorified body. We worrying about it. It ain't going to hurt you. <laughs> and that led to seeing church. They've been telling me, preacher, I don't want to embarrass you or put the spotlight on you. Here's what I've been hearing. It's ever since he's been fighting with us sickness there, heart, whatever's wrong with you. They've been, that's what I've been hearing this. Oh, you ain't never heard such preaching yeah. as our preachers do. Yeah. That's because you can't. And he's just holding that door open. You can't do hardly anything. He's holding that door. <laughs> Y'all need to quit fighting him when he's breaking you in half. Amen. 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 American church's problem is she ain't broke. Any way you want to interpret broke. She ain't broke. She ain't broke financially. She ain't broke spiritually. She ain't broken hearted over her sin. But her life's all broke up. Her mind's all broke up. Homes all broke up. 
Somebody needs to preach a message on let's get the right things broke and get them other things fixed. I can't. I'm going to say this and I think I'm done. I just want you to see. Now I could preach on some doors. I mean I got some doors written down in my Bible up there. God opened Noah's door on that ark. Y'all ain't helping me. Seven days, honey. That door was too big for man to open. God opened that door. And the drawing power of God brought the animals. And then God shut the door. I wish I had somebody. I thought about Lot's door. What about when them angels in there had to grab them daughters? What in the world was wrong with Lot? Put his virgin daughters out there on the street for them, them demon-possessed dogs to have his daughters. What's wrong with the American people put their daughters out on the street? Y'all ain't helping me. But what about them angels, those male men, them angels? Hey, they grabbed them daughters and brought them in and closed the door. <laughs> and that bunch was struck with blindness and could not find the door. I tell you, he can shut a door that no man can open. I'm about to run what I'm about to do. He'll shut a door that no man can open. He had Noah's door open, Lot's door closed. Song of Solomon 5, he came by at midnight trying to get in the door for a time of love with his bride, a midnight visitation. She was in the bed and wouldn't get out of the bed when she finally did. One of the saddest phrases in the Bible, the my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. She took too long to get to the door. Oh, them doors. Glory to God. I'm glad that he's at the door. If you ever get you just a truckload of I can't and I ain't, you can let him in the door. Let him take over. Hallelujah. What hour are we in? Somebody said, we're the gleaners. I don't even think we're the gleaners, preacher. Them great, that great harvest was from 1600 to 1900. And from 1900 on, he's been, he's been drawing Israel back and the time of the Gentiles is diminishing quickly. Some of you like to study in here and y'all help me with this. In the 1500s, them reformers, they stood up it cost them their life. It cost them blood. And they stood up against the Pope and the false church. That's right. In the 1600s, the Puritans purified the church doctrine and they got her back around to grace. Amen. 1700s, they liked what they read so much and studied that you got a bunch of preachers. The Puritans wrote doctrine in the 1600s. The preachers came along and preached it in the 1700s. And in the 1800s, the pioneers, I call the missionaries, Livingston went to Africa and Taylor went to China and Adoniram Judson went to India and, you, and those, the, they purified the doctrine then they preached the doctrine and then they spread it all around the world. The 1800s. You and I got in here in an hour. You go, I'm not going to get too deep into this but you won't find any record of genuine mass revival with mass crowds getting saved after World War II. You hear some of them great preachers of days gone by operating from 1900 to the 1950s and you don't hear about after World War II, you don't hear about much of anything. You got the false revival kicked in real good about then, the charismatic tongue speaking outfit. That false revival spread out strong. Where are we at? We're not the big combine. We're not reaping a harvest. That was 1700s, 1800s. We're not even the gleaners. Them gleaners come by 1900, 1950 and picked it all up. Who are we? I was thinking on that. I think I know who we are. Let me try to 
illustrate it like this. My daddy pastored a church in Missouri, 10 miles from the Missouri River, when I was a child. I was a paper boy. I rode a bicycle, looked like a Norman Rockwell painting. We had 1,100 people in our town. They had a bunch of Germans and Dutch, a bunch of farmers, stubborn. When your license plate tag for your state is the show me state, you better believe there's a bunch of stubborn Germans over there. Our neighbors were the Wims Myers, the Duke Schmaltz, the Wilm Holtz. <laughs> we were Scotch Irish. I was just trying to fight the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> they get out there, preacher on their hands. I remember seeing, and with a pair of scissors snipping their lines on the edges. Precision, perfectionist. We were rednecks. We didn't cut the grass, we killed the grass. Six kids, bird dogs, oil changes here and there. <laughs> Deer hanging off a tree and a car engine hanging off the other tree. You should have seen them, brother. They come to <laughs> all them Germans and Germans. They sniffing their grass and looking over at us. <laughs> Horrified. <laughs> Rednecks from North Georgia. Can I get a witness right there? <laughs> We had a Christian school, and at the end of the year, we'd go do a little fundraiser. And we'd get out one of them cornfields, that black, rich Missouri soil. You talk about growing some out there in the bread basket states. We'd get out there, preacher. The big combines had already come through and filled up the train cars and <coughs> railroaded everything out of town. And then the gleaners had done come through that worked for the farm, got everything else. You know what we did? We'd come out there with two little old pickup trucks and back up into a cornfield. Y'all are supposed to get running ahead of me and get this here in just a minute. We'd get down on our hands and knees, just a few of us, and look for an old corn cob that got left. <laughs> I said we had to get on our hands and knees to find it. After, I said after the big harvest, you had to get on your hands and knees. And Brother Lawson, there'd be one down maybe under a pile of old rotten husk. There'd be one. There'd be one maybe where in the mud, seeing the tractor would come through there and mashed one, and you could see it and stick it out and pull it out of the mud, and you'd holler, I got one. And 10 others run over and you got one, and we'd all look at it. I got one. Clean it off and put it in the truck. I'm about to have a happy bubble. Some of y'all was just an old half rotten corn cob stuck in the mud. After the main harvest done gone, everybody else is going to hell now. But somebody on their hands and knees came and found you. Mm. Get out there in the heat. And I remember staying all day just to get two little old pickup truckloads. We'd haul it off and sell it, you know, and be a little fundraiser. That's who we are. There wasn't 120 got saved in here this morning. You put that man in the 1600s. You talk about some doctrine. I'd like to read it, wouldn't you? You put that man in the 1700s. You talk about some revivals, huh? You let you drop that man in the 1700s and see what kind of. They, they wouldn't have been talking about George Whitfield. They'd been talking about Charles Lawson. You put me or him, and any of you good men in the 1800s, we'd have been on some field somewhere watching half a continent get saved. I wish I could have lived in them first parts of the 1900s where you'd put up a tent and 12,000 to come, 5,000 to get saved because they was lost and they knew it. I wish I had somebody. And everybody supported a meeting, Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, the whole outfit supported me. But we're here, we're now. We got two little old pickups. <laughs> the train done carried the load to glory. We got a couple of little pickups backed up in here and we're all on our hands and knees looking for one. <laughs> oh my, that's where we're at. I don't ever want to be a, I am. Have church with him outside. I 
want to be, I can't. And let God open that door. Open that door. Our heads are bowed. Our musicians come. I want everybody to stand. Won't you young people do again tonight what you did this morning? Won't y'all get down here together, lock arms with each other, and pray for revival to break out amongst you guys? You kids that want to, lock arms with somebody and pray for revival. Won't some of you mamas and daddies and grandmas and grandpas help us pray? The hour we're in, the devils these kids are facing. Won't you help us pray? You go ahead and play, sis, and y'all sing. Page 342 in your All-American. Come help us pray. Come help us pray. Oh, God. Oh, God.
folks, he found every one of us like that. When I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, that's where he found us. That's good preaching. That's good preaching. It's been a good day. The day's not over. I'd like to encourage you to start praying again. Some of you have you haven't started yet. And I guarantee you Satan's going to fight that more than anything. Pray for these young people. They're not growing up in the world that I grew up in. No way, not even close. Not the world I grew up in. The world they're growing up in is a horrid place. It's horrid. Let's pray for them. Let's support them. And pray for those that work with them. It's important that the anointing of God is on this. We can't do anything outside of the Spirit of God. We can't do anything. The arm of the flesh can accomplish nothing. It's been good preaching today. It's kind of preaching that speaks to you and helps you. It's kind of preaching go home, meditate on, think about. You go home and you think about it. I guarantee you I'll be doing a lot of thinking about it. I want you to know, like this brother just preached to you, God the Father is a holy, almighty, invisible, eternal being. And I have serious doubt that anything's ever seen him. Only the Son. He only manifests himself when he chooses. But the Son is the manifestation of God to a broken man. It's God's hand of mercy reaching out to you. If you want to know the Father, you'll only know him through the Son. <coughs> If you ever expect to see the Father, you'll only see Him through the Son. The only approach to God the Father is through God the Son. Like he preached this morning, we do not know how low Christ went. How low did He go? We do not know. Hebrews chapter number 5 said that with strong crying and tears, He prayed, He prayed, He prayed unto Him that was able to save Him from death and was heard and that He feared. Something went on there that boggles the human mind. But the bottom line is that he took it all so that he could take you. He took it all so he could receive you. He took it all so he could make a door open for you. Regardless of what you've done, he paid for that sin. And he understands your soul like no one else does. So think about that. Thank you for the preaching, brother. Thank you for the word of God. His word will not return void. I'd like to get a couple of men to go to the back door and take up an offering for this brother tonight. I appreciate what you gave this morning. If you didn't give, you give an opportunity to give tonight. I'd like to...